Home isn't just a place, it's a feeling. Whether you're at home, your business, or online, ADT helps keep you safe. With security systems, home automation, alarms, and surveillance. So you can feel at home, wherever you are. Go to ADT.com to get that feeling. ADT. Home. Safe. Home. John Gruden with us as he is every Wednesday. This is Motley Crue's Kickstart My Heart. John, how'd we do? If you don't like Motley Crue, you have a screw loop. That is a <laughs> great song. I, I've hung out with Vince Neil before, no doubt. That's a great, great selection. All right. Good job, guys. What was it like when you were hanging out with Vince Neil? I'm just, I'm, I would give anything to have been there. That was a little bit different, but it was uh, one of the thrills of my lifetime. One of my old quarterbacks I coached in Philadelphia, Jay Fiedler, who went on and played for the Dolphins, introduced me to Vince, and uh, it was a lot of fun. Let me just put it that way. That's amazing. That is very cool. Phenomenal. All right, we started out on a good note, and obviously you had a very interesting game this past Monday in Arizona and a huge one coming up with the uh, Washington and Kansas City this coming week. So we will get to that. We know you like talking about football, and so do we. But every now and again, there are these issues, and you were there uh, in Arizona watching the pregame and everything else. And so I just wonder, as we've seen all of this go on around the National Anthem and, and everything else this past week, when you have issues in a locker room that obviously go so far beyond football, so far beyond sports, that are so personal for so many of your players, and that might create some sort of division in your locker room, be it this particular issue or anything that may take place in, in the course of a, of a long season amongst this many people with, with such disparate views of the world. What's a coach's role in that? How does a coach handle a situation where so many players feel so personally involved in something bigger than the sport? Well, I think everybody handles it differently, Mike. I think um, what's going on right now is unprecedented. Um, with the national anthem, but you try to get all the facts. Everybody has issues. Everybody, rookies, veterans, injured players, everybody alive that I've ever met has issues. So uh, what's going on now? I've never seen before. Obviously the owners are involved. It's their football team. They've spent over billions of dollars for these teams. I've I've seen the owners on the field linking arms. So obviously uh, they are going to be involved heavily in whatever happens. But uh, just personally, I'm going to stand for the national anthem, and uh, that won't change. Would it matter to you, from the player standpoint, the type of team you had? If you had a more veteran team, would you kind of let them deal with it? Or if it was a younger team, would you have any conversation with them at at all? How how would how would a John Gruden in the, in the locker room do it? Well, like I said, I, I don't really know how I'd handle this, other than I would let people express their own feelings. It's obviously a very sensitive issue for a lot of people. And I'm, uh, I'm interested in talking about football. To me, uh, this is a, a matter of choice for a lot of players, and uh, I respect everybody's choices, but I know what my selection would be, and uh, hopefully this thing gets resolved soon because this is a great game and a great country, and I don't want to see anybody divided. So then with that said, let's get to the field, and we saw the Cowboys – who, I mean, I tell you what, at halftime of that game, John, I'm thinking, wow, Dallas's offense is just a disaster. Uh, and then the second half obviously changed things, and Dak Prescott was the key to it. Tell us what you saw in that Dallas offense and what you think it means for them going forward this season. I really credit Dallas for hanging in there. That was a horrible first quarter. Their defense made some great adjustments and kept Arizona out of the end zone and kept them in the football game. But What Dak Prescott did just proved why he was a Pro Bowl quarterback as a rookie. He is a miserable man to defend. He can scramble. He can run over you. I compared him to Donovan McNabb because these are horses. These are 240-pound quarterbacks that have rocket arms, and they can run physically through you or around you. And their competitive spirit, this kid's competitive spirit, he never gets rattled. Things are going bad. People are screaming on the sideline. It just never phases them. But he made four or five great plays in the game. And I credit Des Bryant for igniting the team. You know, this guy has hung in there. He's had a tough start the first couple games. But when he caught that shallow cross and ran through Arizona to set the tone for the second half, I thought that jump started Dallas also. 
So the the one thing, though, that makes Dallas run and is the staple of that offense had been the running game and that offensive line. So you look at Denver and what happened when they were just basically get it seemed to be getting beat up front. Then you look at this game where they ran it a little better, but still averaging under four yards a carry. That's not what we're used to seeing out of this running game. So to you, and I know it's usually a combination of things, what are you seeing from this offensive line, from this running game, or from what defenses are doing that is making it a little tougher this year for the Cowboys running the ball? Well, first of all, they didn't play at Denver and at Arizona in the back-to-back uh, weeks early in the season in the last couple of years. These are two formidable defenses. I mean, you and I would love to coach these defenses, Denver and, and Arizona. They can load the box, and they have the coverage people to shut you down. I mean, they're very talented. And they are breaking in a new right tackle. L. Collins played a little bit of left guard, missed 13 games last year. He's making the transition to right tackle. It's going to take a little time. And the combination of working with Zach Martin at right guard, that's going to take a little time. And uh, I think Chaz Green at left guard is going to be a good player, but it's not going to happen overnight. He's replacing Ron Leary, who left for Denver, and he's working with Tyron Smith. They haven't worked together before. So the chemistry, as they break in these two linemen, is going to take a little bit of time. They've gone against two great defensive teams on the road, in the noise, early in the season. But when you look at them carefully in the fourth quarter, it looked like they were gelling pretty quickly. And uh, unfortunately for a lot of people, they're still going to be a force. Yeah, Mike and Mike and John Gruden. So just to take that further, last year they were second in the National Football League. The Cowboys were in time of possession. And, of course, that running game and Zeke were the key to it. Right now, through three games, they're 28th in the league in time of possession. But what you're saying is you see that as that line gels, you think their running game will be as effective as it was a year ago. And I guess the second question would be, if it isn't, if it isn't quite as dominant as it was a year ago, do you think they can still win big riding the quarterback? I think they can. I don't have any questions about their offensive line if these five men stay healthy like they did last year. The big question right now at Dallas' time of possession is, can their defense get some three and outs? Mm. They were the number one defense last year against the run, and that's a huge statement. But they have a new middle linebacker right now, Jalen Smith, filling in for Anthony Hitchens. They have a number of new players playing in the secondary. They've got some suspensions on the defensive line. But time of possession – Ball control involves both sides of the football. And right now, Dallas is breaking in a lot of new players. But what a huge credit to them for coming off a terrible outing and going on national TV and taking away Arizona. That was a big, big win for them. Every year we get a surprises or a few surprises, John, and I would say one this year has been uh, Kareem Hunt, the third-round pick, the kid out of Toledo, the running back for Kansas City who's, who's just hit the ground running, <laughs> uh, to use that term, and catching the ball out of the backfield. And to this point, so I'm sure a lot of people didn't see this coming, maybe some Andy Reid in the organization to a point. So here's a guy that's getting roughly 20 touches a game. As a coach, when you see a rookie doing this, and we had this discussion with Zeke Elliott last year about do you be careful with him because he's a rookie, he's used to X amount of games, he's going that many more games. From a head coaching standpoint, how do you decide and or is you just we run him, we use him as much as we can, or we have to think about this as the season gets longer? Well, if you have a great back that's healthy and hot, you know, <laughs> And I'm not going to make any apologies. We're going to try to feature him, just like Dallas did with Zeke Elliott last year. It doesn't matter what year you are. If this man has proven that he knows what he's doing and he's versatile and he's making plays, we have to heat him up. And we have to be smart about it. Obviously, we got to hear from him and hear from the trainers and everybody else. But I admire what they're doing with this kid. I'm just watching their film right now. They are a tough outfit to defend. He's the centerpiece right now, but... They have Tyreek Hill going one way, Kelsey going the other. You forget Kareem Hunt's on the field. You make a mistake. It's it's hard offense to defend because you don't know what's coming. There are a ton of misdirection plays. I keep heating up Hunt. He is just running too good right now, and he's a great receiver. And and you have to give the, the five guys up front credit as well. That That's a lot, an offensive line that's been maligned a bit, and they seem to be getting it together a lot better this year. And Kareem Hunt taking advantage of that as well. The team they're playing, the Redskins, seem to be a team, John, to me, that a lot of people left out of the NFC East to talk. It was, oh, the Giants are going to do this. Dallas, boy, I wonder what Philly's going to do. 
And then there's the Redskins. Boy, the Redskins' defense, we're getting the offensive side of the ball for a minute. Their defense, they have been shutting down wide receivers this year. Well, they've, they've added some players. Uh, the last couple of years, it's been tough. They weren't very good, obviously, on third down last year. And they got some young players that are playing well. I really credit Zach Brown. I call it the Zach Brown band right now on defense. <laughs> He's come in here as the lead singer of this outfit and made all kinds of plays. This man can run. He's hungry. He's sideline to sideline. And what he's done is elevate the play of others. Jonathan Allen, a draft pick from Alabama, played a good game. They brought in some, some players in the secondary, like Dante Nicholson, a rookie out of Michigan State, who's made some good plays. They're coming together. They're young. they got a ways to go, and they'll be challenged certainly against Kansas City. Mike and Mike, John Gruden, again, that's a really good game coming up this Monday. Uh, your old colleague against your brother with uh, Washington and Kansas City and Andy Reid and Jay Gruden coaching. Uh, another thing, around the league a little bit here, we were just talking about this a little while ago. But Odell Beckham Jr., for my money, is as dynamic a player as we have in the sport, and he was sensational for an offense that has done nothing all year. In that fourth quarter against Philadelphia, he almost single-handedly won them that game, but he had the celebration in the end zone where he looked like a dog urinating and everyone's aggravated and including the owner, John Mara, who sent an email saying, I do not want to get into a discussion about this, but I will say that I'm very unhappy with Odell's behavior on Sunday, and we intend to deal with it internally. John, you got an incredibly good player who's doing stuff that isn't necessarily hurting the team beyond the fact that in this case it was a 15-yard penalty, but now the owner is involved saying he doesn't like the way it, um, it, it, it portrays the franchise. What does the coach do? What, what are you doing there if you're Ben McAdoo? Well, you just got to let them know it's embarrassing to, to the brand of football. It's embarrassing to your brand, and it's embarrassing to my brand. And football is not that important to me. You know, we're, we're going to try every, everything we can do to win a football game, but that's just illogical what he did. I'm sure he's embarrassed about that. He's such an emotional guy. I don't know what goes through his mind when he's making big plays and, and, and things like that, but that's got to be addressed. And uh, if you have to sit down, uh, you have to sit down, but uh, that's that's just not good for football. It's not good at all. John, how do you deal with when you go to London, and we're doing it more and more again this week, did it last week, and basically the Ravens, and, and we know it happens every now and then, even on our own soil, that, that you just have a bad game. But you, you, when you travel that far and you're basically a no-show, as a coach, as John Harbaugh is going to have to do, how would you deal with a game like that when you're traveling? Do you just put it away, or do you really focus on the mistakes that were made in it? You know, Mike, they'd probably have to have a private plane to take me home. Uh, I'd have a hard time flying nine hours home getting beat like that. That that has to really bother Coach Harbaugh and the coaches and the players uh, to go out there. And uh, I turned it off. It was 44 to nothing. I think the Ravens were heavily favored in that game. I don't know what happened. I have not seen that tape yet. But that was one of the stunners that uh, have I have seen in pro football, at least on the scoreboard in the last few years. But you just got to bite your lip. Study the tape, see what happened, address it the next day when you have let your mind and your emotions clear. That's that's the only thing you can do, as you know. When did when did Sunday's game end for you as a coach for your team? Like, t- take us kind of through Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. When was it put aside and you went on to next week? Well, I was uh, look. I, I I was I was a, I was a strange coach. I, I uh, when we won, we looked good. I couldn't wait to go in and watch the tape. I'd be calling the video guys. Hey, I got to see what happened. And when we lost, uh, you know, we had to make we had to get back at it. I had a hard time leaving the office after that guy game. Uh, that's why it's a good thing I'm in the booth right now mm-hmm. because uh, this is a profession coaching uh, where. You have a tendency to overdo things sometimes in terms of preparation, but that was all I felt I could bring to the table was was preparation and making corrections and getting guys ready and studying the next opponent. Uh, and I, I think that's pretty global around the league of football. Mike and Mike and John Gruden, one more quickly from me. Uh, Deshaun Watson this weekend went to the place that rookie quarterbacks traditionally go to die, if you will. No one ever goes in there and beats Belichick and Brady, and he came awfully close, and he played great. Have you had a chance to look at that tape? And if so, what are you seeing from him? Because if he gives them that kind of spark with the playing the defense the way they can, I get that Brady threw all those touchdowns, but Houston might be looking at something good here. Have you had a chance to see what the rookie quarterback did? I did, Mike. That's uh, the game that I really focused on in my hotel when we were in Arizona. 
what this man can do with his legs is 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 pretty exciting. He can scramble and keep plays alive. And I will say this uh, about the Patriot defense right now: they are not the same defense they were a year ago. I just saw the Kansas City film. They had a lot of broken coverages. I don't think they're collectively playing as a unit yet. And the Sean Watson running and passing that dimension he has is tough on any defense. But I'm really impressed with the way he's throwing the football and managing a complex offense. I saw him audible a few times, make some difficult throws. And when the game gets tight, remember this about Deshaun Watson. That's when he gets right. He he plays his best football at crunch time, and i got a lot of respect for him. We saw it in the college yeah, championship absolutely. game a year ago. It should be a great one this weekend. Again, Skins and Chiefs on Monday Night Football from Kansas City. We'll see you there. Thank you, John. Thanks, John. Enjoy the barbecue. All right, guys. Have a great week. <laughs> That's see John you. Gruden with us. On the Shell Pennzoil Performance Line, taking synthetic motor oil performance to a whole new level. Make the switch to Pennzoil Synthetics today. I, I can tell already. I, I, and, and Bickler, it's your job to put music up on the board, right? So at any point when he made the reference that he did, did you get involved and put up any Zach Brown songs. If it was me, it would be nothing but Zach Brown, Zach Brown band, but I go to Ray for this kind of music. Okay, so you didn't put anything up there? No, I, no, have, I asked Ray, and then I put I, it up I, there. I can, I can tell you the music that I have up here. I, I have Kickstart My Heart by Motley Crue, yeah. which we played for John. I have this one for you. Okay. I have that, and, and then I have, uh, for no obvious reason, I have Bruno Mars. <laughs> He made a great reference. Zach Brown, phenomenal, <laughs> phenomenal country music. Zach Brown's the linebacker for the Washington Redskins, who has a tackling machine, about a 250-pounder, just, just can absolutely destroy anything, He and, and he's playing great this year. Made a great reference, so I was ready to play a little Zach Brown, and here we go. That's a really good game coming up Monday oh, night. Oh, it absolutely All other is. Equal. Yeah. Um, you've got a Kansas City team that's gotten off to this unbeaten. There's only two unbeaten teams left in the sport, right. and they're one of them, and they're playing really well, and Smith is playing well, and the defense is really good, and they, they're more explosive than they've been in recent years, and obviously the rookie running back is sensational. Mm -hmm. And Washington, you're right. They're, they're the team that I forgot about. I, everybody the is. They everybody lost is. the receivers. They're, they're shutting down receivers. So this is going to the tight ends at the beginning of the yards. That's why, okay, Tyreek Hill. Now he's got the speed. Travis Kelsey. When Gronk's been nicked up, Kelsey's the best tight end in the game. And then you got this rookie sensation in Kareem Hunt. I mean, a great test for this Washington defense. Home isn't just a place. It's a feeling that you're safe to enjoy the things that matter most. ADT lets you take that feeling with you, whether you're at home, your business, or online. We help keep you safe with security systems, home automation, alarms, and surveillance, so you can feel at home wherever you are. Go to ADT.com to get that feeling for less than a dollar a day. ADT. Home. Safe. Home. Okay, Kevin, for the grand prize of $1 million. What color is the White House? Um, I know this, I know this, I know this. Um, five seconds. Oh, switching to Geico could save you a bunch of money on car insurance? Okay. Judges? That's true, Kevin. They'll allow it. Congratulations. You're a winner. Woo! Geico, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. Okay. All right, I, I promise that we're not going to do this uh, all the time, but when the president does tweet about pro football, I think it is at least our obligation yeah. to read it. It happened again this morning. Uh, president Trump tweeting 19 minutes ago, spoke to Jerry Jones of the Dallas Cowboys yesterday. Jerry is a winner who knows how to get things done. Players will stand for country, exclamation point. That See, was that, that, a that's tweet why, from President Trump. That's why I asked yesterday, did, did the Dallas Cowboys do the best of both worlds to people? By kneeling to show their unity, but it was before the flag or the anthem played and then stood. Uh, everybody stood for the anthem and the flag. And is that the way people, teams will do it? Or those that still want to have their, their silent, peaceful protest, will they say, well, we really feel we're accomplishing it if we do it during the national anthem. So we'll see where it goes. But, uh, for Jerry Jones has said they're, they're going to stand for the anthem. That's been talked about in Carolina as well, where Jerry Richardson, the owner, who was a former player, has met with some of the captains yesterday who were not happy right. that they couldn't do some of the, you know, the kneel downs that they wanted to do. So these are the discussions that are going on. All right. We will get back to that, uh, at some point. Again, it, it's, I think it's worth mentioning when the president tweets about something that involves the National Football League.
And then we move on. Again, every Wednesday at this time, we're delighted to bring Kirk Herbstreit into the conversation. College game day this week in Blacksburg for Clemson and Virginia Tech. But before we get to that, Herbie, I got to tell you, I thought you, ha- you guys had the game of the year Saturday night. That Penn State-Iowa game was so incredibly entertaining. You guys did a terrific job. And there were a million different things from the walk-off touchdown at the right, very right. end. To, to Greeny's statement. Oh, I fell in love with Saquon Barkley. That's it. <laughs> Saquon Barkley, Herbie, I don't want to overstate this, is the greatest football player that ever lived. Can we just can we say that? And then we'll just, Does that strike you as, as they go? How, I mean, how do you put into words what that kid did in that game? Oh, my God. Um, it's like you just run out of things to say about a guy. You know, you just, you just, what else can I say? Um, he, 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 uh, as a freshman two years ago, he ran for 200 yards against Ohio State. And I think that was the night he caught my eye. He was in Columbus and, and I fell in love with the kid that night. And it wasn't as if what I witnessed on Saturday made me go, man, this guy's incredible. It was just, I, I didn't think he could raise the bar much higher than he already had, in, in my uh, opinion of him. And he did, you know, for, for you to say what you said, I think a lot of people around the country are probably thinking the same thing, like, man, the last back I saw in college football that was this good was whoever that would be. I mean, maybe a Reggie Bush as far as ability to control your body, the balance, the explosiveness. Um, and I'm talking Reggie Bush at USC, not right, the NFL. Right. Yeah, we brought that up um, yesterday. Yeah, yeah, I don't know, man. Yeah. It, it's, he's the only guy that comes to my mind. Um, I, I just, and the greatest thing about this guy is how humble, unselfish. He probably went Sunday back to Penn State and got underneath the squat rack. Like, he's just that guy. You know, he's, he's, um, he's hungry, he's determined, he's on a mission. And I saw Josie Jewell, the kid on the other side, the linebacker, who was really we, – we kind of created a one-on-one matchup with those two because they, they really were – he was in coverage and pass coverage. He had him. He was obviously – Iowa defense is, is built where the linebacker, the middle linebacker is going to make a lot of tackles. So he was trying to make plays. He had a huge interception that, that got Iowa back in it. Uh, so I thought Josie Jewell had a great game, the middle linebacker for, for Iowa. So you're right, it was very different kind of game compared to those 48-45 kind of games. Iowa's defense was backed up by their own goal line the entire night and kept holding strong to keep them in the game and comes down to the last play of the game and, and, I, and Penn State ends up delivering. But yeah, we, we kind of had a little bit of everything in that game. You, you really did. And when you look back on seasons, you know, there's always the what ifs and there's always the handful of plays that are in a game or then the handful of plays that are in a season that you kind of look at. And here you go with one where we keep talking about Barkley, but it's the last play. It's a seven-yard pass from McSorley to Johnson that you may look back and yeah. said saves our season. And maybe on the other side of it, do you look at the, the, the attempted play in the Oklahoma State TCU game mm. of somebody throwing a pass other than Mason Rudolph in a very, very <laughs> critical part of the game that turns into an I interception. Know. I mean, I look at both of those and say, man, I'm not saying that would have been the end-all, be-all for, for Oklahoma right. State because you give TCU the credit for what they did. But the two yeah. differences of this play for Penn State maybe saving the season and what the hell were you thinking in Oklahoma State with that play call? <laughs> Isn't that so true? I mean, anybody who ends up in college football, and probably true in pro too, but you get to that point in December and kind of turn around and look at the season that they had and, and the what-if moments. The teams that end up winning championships and the, and the teams that end up kind of catching a few breaks, games like last weekend, they find a way – to win and or teams find a way to lose uh and and it kind of changes the complexion of of where their path might be headed but great teams have to find a way to win those games and you could say whatever you want about how it turned out i thought penn state played great and i think people underestimate how tough of an environment they were in and how tough a team they played um there, there are not a whole lot of teams that night and that setting that, that would have been able to get out of there alive. It wasn't like, you know, sometimes you see great teams that end up winning uh, all their games and they just had their C-plus game going that day. That, that was not the case in, in this game. It, this was just, I was a pretty darn good football team, especially when you play them in Kinnick at night. It's just one of those teams you got to be careful of. I'll give you Ohio State, and I think it's November 4th. They go to Iowa City 
and have to deal with that same kind of team. And it'll be interesting to see if they're still in the mix, how they deal with Iowa. Iowa just, I don't think the nation gets Iowa. Uh, just because they're not flashy, they don't throw it 50 times a game, they don't score 50 points a game, but they're still a very tough football team. But, yeah, the Mason Rudolph thing, I'm sure uh, you know, Mike Gundy's got to be looking at that, saying because they just hit a big play yep. and look like, boy, they're about to, about to gain the momentum, and then they tried a little trickery and, and it backfired. But uh, TCU, I think, reminded people that, that they, um, you know, they, they're playing better defense this year, they have better depth. Um, and the Kenny Hill kid is really playing good football, throwing the ball with much more accuracy. And I kind of like TCU before the game. I thought there was a lot of attention being given to, to Oklahoma State, and I just hadn't seen a quality opponent at that point. And I thought we'd really learn more about them if they were able to beat TCU. And all of a sudden now TCU has become kind of that that uh, that team that everybody's buzzing about this week. No, I'll give you credit. You had it right before that game, and I'll say this. I watched that entire game. Oklahoma State might have come back and won it, but they got outplayed the yeah, entire TCU day. TCU played better. They did. TCU was the better team yeah. on the field I that agree. day. Yeah. You know, I want to ask you about something kind of off the field here. I saw some comments from Jim Harbaugh talking about the, the, the condition of the facilities that his players dealt with at Purdue over the weekend. And a lot of other of that conversation seems to be coming up now in, in certain places, particularly around the Big Ten. And, and I, I, went, I saw on your Twitter feed that you were tweeting a little bit about it as well. Could you share a little bit of that with our audience? Because we talk all the time about how much money is involved here and all that kind of stuff. It doesn't yeah. seem right that there wouldn't be first class, particularly facilities for players who were injured uh, in all of these in these you know Division One stadiums. What, what can you share with us? Well, this isn't a slap in the face to Purdue. This is more of uh, more than really the Big Ten, and you can look around even in the SEC and the Big Twelve, some of these other conferences. When you have older stadiums, and sometimes they renovate and they put a lot of money into their stadiums, um, they're putting them into more of the luxury boxes, or they're doing something to the field, or they're doing something to the home locker room. And I think sometimes, you know, back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, it was kind of, as he said, gamesmanship to kind of make the, the visiting team's locker room not the greatest. But as we've done, the money that's gone into the sport and the way the game has changed and just the way the facilities have changed, my dad played at Ohio State in 1960, and I'd love to know how much that visiting locker room at Ohio State has changed from 1960 to today. Uh, and I think it's it's not just Purdue. It's around college football in general. You don't have to make them luxurious, but you do need to accommodate them. I, I can't remember. There was one place in the Big Ten. They had two bathrooms in the entire locker room. And, you know, you're taking a shower when it's 30 degrees outside, and, you, and you're going to take a shower, and the water's cold. Um, it, it just it, it, It's one thing to have – you know, a pink locker room, and it's another thing not to have accommodations. And so I think what Jim Harbaugh is saying is, hey, guys, these locker rooms were built in the 20s, and how about we, including, he said including ourselves, how about we go out and, and try to make things a little bit better for the visiting teams? Like I said, we don't need real nice carpet and real big lockers in the visiting locker room, but we do need to make it, like you said, an X-ray uh, equipment to be, that could be in, in the visiting locker room. Any kind of thing that can help the players uh, have a better a better trip and a more accommodating trip, I think it's a it's a no brainer. I, I, I applaud him. I watch his press conference every week because I think it's awesome. It's fun. Um, and this week he was actually a little bit more in a little bit more conversation with the media than, than normal weeks, and that was one of the things he was really adamant about. And uh, again, I hope it doesn't come across that it's just Purdue because it's not. It's pretty universal, and and I hope. Uh, what he brought up uh, creates some change. Oh, that was great. Listen, anything pertaining to player safety, first and foremost, should always yeah, be should. A given in that yeah. circumstance. All right, again, Herbie and company in Blacksburg this week should be a great one. Clemson and Virginia Tech. Thank you, Herbie. See you Thanks, next Herbie. week. All right, there's an enormous amount of Twitter reaction, as you might imagine, to a variety of different topics today, um, and we'll go through them. And as the rest of the country joins us, I'll, I'll mention again, Jay Billis and Seth Greenberg together off the top of the next hour with insight into the basketball side and the legal side of the latest with the FBI and the NCAA. And I'll read a bunch of the Twitter as well.
But first, Straight Talk brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless. Best phones, best networks, no contracts. You just heard Kirk Herbstreet talking about Jim Harbaugh. Right. Suggesting that he did not feel that the visiting locker room facilities. accommodations, yeah. uh, uh, facilities, thank you is a better word, were suitable for his team at Purdue this past week and that this is not limited to Purdue, but that this is something that should be addressed and that he says, Jim says, <clears throat> Michigan will be a leader in that going forward. I know, Mike, you have a reaction. Oh, yeah. I heard on uh, uh, Paul Feinbaum's show mm-hmm. yesterday he had uh, i believe it was booger and greg mcelroy yeah and they were talking about this and i believe it was booger who kind of sided with what you just heard from herbie and harbaugh that you know the facilities need to be better and mcelroy was like no man it's a visiting locker room i'm kind of on that side now let me quickly separate from a player safety standpoint There should be no exceptions there. You need to have, and I don't know where it was, there were conflicting reports on where an x-ray machine was. Anything like that needs to be available to the players. So let me get that out of the way. From a safety standpoint, you know, the x-ray machine and finding out those injuries right away, there needs to be something there. But let me tell you what. My program has money and I'm redesigning things. I'm saving my last dollar for the visiting locker room. And if I run out of money, oh, well. If there's three stalls, oh, well. If there's no carpeting, oh, well. If it's a little smaller, oh, well. I don't care. I mean, right now, the thing is, you know, some of them are like pink or whatever. Yes. There's a color they use that's supposed to be a calming color that they'll paint locker rooms that way. Which, you know, that part I have zero that's a little issue bit again. with. Th- th- that I think no one should do have. Do I an care issue if they're a little bit smaller, a little bit cramped? You know, there's maybe not as, you know, three stalls instead of five stalls. Uh, you know, no, I don't. I don't. It, that doesn't matter to me. I'm not. And, and I understand you don't have to make a Taj Mahal. But to me, you know what? There you go. You know, get dressed, do your thing. You know, you bring in your 85 guys or whatever. We got 85 spaces for you. Go ahead. You know, do it. If oh, it's a little warm, a little cold, you know. It'll it'll heat up or it'll cool down. You know, give it some time. Well, it won't cool down. There isn't air conditioning, so this game was played. It's a reason there, you know. But but this game was played in plus ninety degree temperatures, and so the players come in. It isn't air conditioned either. In the um, it was unseasonably uh, hot for this game. Right. Yes. But that's is that is that could that be construed as I, I, a safety risk? I, I'm not I guess, redoing my question. entire locker room because I may have one game that's unseasonably hot. Open a door, you know. So <laughs> well, again, it was unseasonably hot. So opening the door would probably wouldn't have cooled it off. I may get a little breeze. Where, where I where I would where I would ask the question would be what is and what isn't an issue involving the safety of the mm-hmm. players. Yeah. So if it is in any way potentially, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, dangerous to the players' safety to not be able to cool off properly or whatever it is after a game. Yeah, to fans be still sitting in there. They bring fans. There are things they can do. You can find a way. Come on. Well, I mean, I mean it doesn't please. strike me as though it's that complicated to put air conditioning in a locker okay. room, All though. Right. I mean, That's you fine. could do that. You, I don't yeah. know how expensive that is. But I know they, 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 boy, they put it right in in the garden. They loved having that in the, in the garden, so, yes, didn't so they? That is okay. the, the Boston <laughs> Garden legendarily. Turn on the fans. Red Auerbach would, <laughs> yeah. but again, that's a totally different era. But everyone knows okay. that when you were there, Red Auerbach, they would make sure if it, on a hot day that was it was impossibly hot, and a cold day it was impossibly cold. Okay. Is that gamesmanship or is that? I'm not losing my mind over that one bit you got a locker to get ready you got a table to sit on and get your ankle taped okay you're good i I, i'm I'm fine with it i mean boy i remember the old cleveland stadium when i was when i was playing in the the nfl my god you basically got a nail in the wall when they opened the door for people to come in the whole cold breeze came in and froze you out they didn't really care much there and and i'm i don't care that much i honestly don't I'll, I'll make it, you know, so you can accommodate your players. But I'm, I'm certainly not, you know, revamping and making it this great thing for you. And you will have everything you need from a safety set, from that x-ray machine. I, I get that. But other than that, I'm not losing my mind over that. Not at all. I mean, I, in, in my uh, time of covering the sport, the bigger concern to me would be the conditions on the field. I mean, I oh sure, I thought you were going to go back to the vet, and I remember covering a game oh, that in your was stadium horrific. at the vet where Wendell Davis jumped up for a pass, came down, and both his kneecaps fell Listen, off. The NFL, the union, my union, when I was playing, the teams filed a grievance every time they played yeah. a game at Vets. And, and I agreed. It was horrific. So, yeah. no, no, no. Again, that's separate. We're talking about the locker rooms yeah. and making them nicer and more accommodating. I'm like, eh, you know, if I got a couple extra bucks, maybe I will. Uh, to, to me, maybe I'll throw you some extra towels. Yeah, the, the entire line to me would be there's a difference between safety yeah. and 
comfort, yes, for lack exactly. of a better word. Yes, it is. Straight Talk Wireless Nationwide coverage on America's largest and most dependable 4G LTE networks. Back in a flash, Mike and Mike.